All right. Um, first of all, thank you so much for showing up, all of you, because I know it's the last session of the last day, so you are the bravest one just to stick into the plan until the end. Um, um, so um, I'm going to talk about the results of my PhD. I'm uh, writing up here, so it's quite nice to present all the data set when it's completed, because you kind of tend to present as the data comes, and you don't really have the entire picture until the end. So this is uh, the only presentation I'm going to give in my last year, because I'm really, really late and <laughs> writing up, so I don't really have time for conferences. But it's been really fun to kind of play around with the graphs and see what is coming out of the data set. And the reason why I'm presenting, so I mean, the, the focus of the presentation is not um, as much on the results itself, but um, I would quite like to reflect with you as well on, during the discussion about how important is the theoretical framework that we use when we approach the data the first time. And this will make sense once I kind of uh, show you the results, but my idea was uh, completely different to what I was going to get, and then very often times uh, the data uh, disprove us, and I was also part of the fun, really, to like, deal with um, historical societies. Um, so my PhD deals with food economy and social inequalities in medieval Islamic Portugal, um, and the period it's between the 8th century to the 14th century, and what we have during this period is a first Islamic uh, rule, and then around 12th and 13th century, so there's usually like, not usually, like there is almost 100 years of Christian reconquest. So the Portugal would be a Christian kingdom by the 13th century. Um, and of course, what we were um, interested, well, I'm gonna talk about the, sorry, the mythology first, but we, in order to access um, and explore these ideas of like food consumption, and dietary patterns coming out of this, period, Islamic period first, and then of course the transition with the Christian kingdom. Uh, we use a variety of bi biomolecular analysis, so stabilizer top of carbon and nitrogen it was my main technique um, that I used on both animal and human remains, uh, bone collagen mainly, but I also you, you did some analysis on dentin, uh, mainly for juvenile diet. Um, I use radiocarbon dating for a very special multi-faith burial site that I've got from Portugal where Muslim and Christian graves were intercutting each other and we thought they were contemporaneous and guess what, they were not contemporaneous just to mix, my, mix up all my ideas. Um, and then I use zooms, uh, which is a technique that we use in York, um, which is, uh, stands for zooarchaeology by mass spectrometry, and it's able to assign to species all zooarchaeological samples a bit ambitious. A lot of the zooarchaeological samples, especially sheep goat, so it kind of gives an idea of uh, which is which. Um, and then I integrated all the bi biomolecular analysis with anthropological and paleopathological data. In some cases, I was able to do it myself. In some other cases, the collection were already studied. So. I kind of blend in the data of the anthropologist uh, studying the sites. So the research aims uh, changed a lot through time. <laughs> and at the beginning, we just wanted to explore diet in medieval Portugal. And the reason being is that there is nothing published or done on dietary practices in medieval Portugal, but just Portugal in general. We have some studies on prehistory, and that's it. There's nothing else. So we had no idea on what to expect. There is some study uh, that has been published um, uh, recently by my supervisor, Michel Alexander, on Spain. Um, Portugal and Spain were under the same Islamic rule, so they were one kind of um, political entity uh, during the early medieval period. But we were not sure, especially because the environment is very different. So Spain is over the Mediterranean and Portugal is on the Atlantic coast. So we weren't really sure what was going on there, if we could expect the same type of result um, in terms of Islamic diet. On Muslim diet. Um, of course we were intrigued by this presence of different faith and I was very skeptical of finding any faith related difference in the data set because I believe that the environment was more important. Um, so uh, we were interested of course in see any um, difference in, in faith related um, uh, con food consumption but also identified geographical and site type variation practices because Portugal, if you've ever been to Portugal, has a kind of a wide range of climates. So the very north of Portugal is very Atlantic, uh, wet, um, basically 10 months a year. And then if you move, <laughs> if you move down south in the Algarve, it's very, very dry. So we have more kind of a Mediterranean climate in the south and a more Atlantic climate in the north. And that is gonna impact on the agriculture as well. 
And then the last aim that kind of came out in the last few months of my PhD as all the data was coming together is that actually I think, I don't know if I'll be able to convince you, that I could assess the impact of the Christian conquest onto the dietary practices of Portugal. So I had too many sites, including my PhD, um, and I'm just going to talk about three main urban sites uh, today, which are uh, Lisbon, Beja, which is a multi-faith site, and Silves, where we also have Christian and, and uh, Muslim uh, burials. These are all the number of individuals and uh, samples that I have analyzed, definitely too many. Um, don't do that if you ever want to finish on time. And then we have uh, kind of a range of sites um, urban and rural, inland and coastal, and of course this big difference between the north of Portugal and the south of Portugal. So um, I'm just going to talk about the trends. So I'm basically picking just the cool stuff that came out of my results, which is what you, you do usually when you can pick from a wi wide range of data. Um, and we did find a sex related difference in diet, however, in only one population. So out of the eight sites that I have analyzed, only one population came out to be different in their food consumption depending on sex. Um, and oh, I have to say, the evidence is not that strong because the sample size is quite small. So the um, um, individuals that are blank um, are females, and these two blue squares are males. This is the highest status population from Lisbon Castle. If you've been to Lisbon, there's like a, a really nice Arab fortress on top of the hill. And these individuals were buried within the castle itself. It was only a small burial site, um, and there's the reason why we think it's a privileged population, because Muslim burials are usually outside the city walls, and we don't find any burials within the city. Um, so we saw this pattern coming out, and I was really uh, excited, and I started to think about all the possible implications, because the organization of the Islamic family is quite well known. Women were usually not allowed to spend too much time outside of the household, while the men were kind of free to go. Um, so then I compared this population to another urban population from Lisbon, contemporaneous, from our necropolis outside of the city wall. Surprise, it looks the same as the females. Both males and females are represented in the yellow population, which is in the Alfama neighborhood, but we have no difference. So in this case, um, the female portrays quite of a local signature of diet, which by the way is based on terrestrial resources. So what we're seeing here is main domestics being consumed and of course plant C3 plants. We have no millet, no sorghum, no sugar cane coming into the diet that it shows in, um, in isotopic data. Um, so the males are doing something different. Um, and what I cannot tell you is what they're doing. And unfortunately the biotype was so small I cannot I don't have any more samples to see if this is a trend that is actually happening or I am just making this up because I have missing data that links the two groups. Uh, what is true uh, is that this is the only site that shows this trend and my other two viral sites that are quite substantial in numbers don't show any sex related difference in diet. So as you can see two different colors, males and females, I don't have any patterning coming out. Um, the second trend is a faith related difference. So this was very exciting, um, and as I said, I was very skeptical. I did not expect my Muslim and my Christian to look any different because they were sharing the same location, the same geographical place. And I believe the environment was way more important than religion or faith or culture in this, in this case. Uh, but I was wrong, and um, we have all the Muslim again uh, showing a very terrestrial diet, uh, we, you see it is spread in nitrogen, so uh, the Muslim individuals are using all sorts of different trophic level protein coming into their diet, um, and the Christians show a very typical fishy, if you want to use that term, trend, which is increasing carbon and nitrogen. So when these two values and are enriched, uh, we kind of call this like a trend line, which is kind of, it indicates a major consumption, not major, but an increasing consumption of marine resources. Um, this, I know that this one looks a bit crammed, but this is just because the scale of the population, if you have a look at the scale, it's a very different scale, because I have these mad individuals here, they are eating basically just fish, and these two fishes here. So the scale, I know it looks, it looks really basically the same, but it is statistically significant. So I, I ran the test several times. As I said, I was skeptical, so I was just to make sure that it was actually significant. 
Um, so, um, yes, there is a fair related difference, which was really exciting because the previous data generated for Spain for the same period did not have any difference. So something is happening in Portugal that did not happen in Spain. However, I'm going to point out to you, and then it's also going to be uh, the next slide, that these two collections are not contemporaneous. So Maslin and Christian from the same site are not contemporaneous. Beja has been radiocarbon dated, and the Christian burials date from the 14th to the 16th century. And the Christian burials in Silves were, um, well, uh, were around the cathedral, which was founded after the Christian conquest. So there is a fate-related difference, but there is also a chronological difference, which is our third trend. So we saw these two collections being different um, based on the chronology. So at this point, um, I could not tell you if it's a fate related difference only or it's a chronological difference because I didn't have any more data. And then one last collection came from Lisbon. So these Muslim individuals are from the uh, Muslim quarter. After the Christian conquest, Jewish and Muslim are allowed to live in Lisbon and in other Christian, well, newly Christian um, urban centers, but they are confined in a specific place. So these are the late medieval Muslim living in Lisbon under Christian rule. So we are looking at minority rule. And when this result came out, and they're looking, they have the same values as the Vikings in Orkney. That's the amount of fish that these people are eating. And I was not expecting this whatsoever, because the entire Muslim diet they have for the early medieval period is terrestrial. So then um, my idea of a fate related difference only uh, pattern it was not standing anymore. So what I think I see here is more of a chronological difference. So all the population there from the late medieval period, regardless of the faith, have an increasing amount of marine resources into their diet, and all the early medieval population do not have it. So um, there are three main things that we need to consider, and they're kind of helping my point, which is, can I assess the impact of the Christian conquest? I don't think I can say a definite yes or no. However, I do have a clear chronological trend in fish consumption that is not related to fate only. And the body suggests offshore fishing. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it's not just the carbon that it's increasing, which means that the more, more marine resources are consumed, but it's also the nitrogen that indicates higher trophic level fishes being included in the diet. And the higher trophic level fishes, the bigger fishes are offshore. Um, so, they're not just eating more fish, they're eating bigger fishes, and they're going out to fish them. Um, what do we know about the cultural preferences of these people? It is true that in Islamic cookbooks, less than 10% of the recipes actually um, well, include fish preparations. So there is, and we know from the zoological perspective that the preferred meat was definitely sheep goat at every site, rabbit sometimes in Portugal, there's this trend coming out. So we do have a cultural preference for Muslim assemblages um, towards kind of more terrestrial diet. Um, and it is also true that during the Islamic period in Portugal, um, it wasn't safe to fish offshore because the coast was constantly patrolled by ships of the northern Portuguese kingdom trying to conquer the Islamic south. So it wasn't safe to go so far off from the coast. So although they were consuming some fish, and we find mollusks, we find small fish like sardines, which are still like a staple food in Portugal nowadays, they were not going too far off from the coast. Um, the third evidence that I have from the historical sources is actually an over-exploitation of the Portuguese coast. So the extreme fishing that was undertaken once Portugal was kind of unified under Christian rule um, had a big impact on the availability of marine species. And we know actually from also from modern times that it's very easy and it doesn't take that long to fish all the way down your ecosystem if you do an extreme, if you practice an ex extreme type of fishing. So as early as 1353, so less than 100 years after the Christian conquest of Portugal, Dom Pedro I of Portugal signed an agreement with King Edward III of England to fish near the English coast for 50 years because they were already running out of the main desired species. So in conclusion, we do see a sexualized difference in diet, however, it's only for our high status population. So it looks like the diet, dietary practices in Islamic population are very homogeneous based on uh, sex categories. 
Um, there is a favorability difference in diet found on multiple sites. However, um, this is combined with also chronological different, a difference in diet. So in, on multiple sites in Lisbon, in Beja, and in Silvish, I see an economic change that is detected in dietary practices. And both Muslim and Christian show a greater reliance on marine resources after the Christian conquest in the order of between the 10 and the 20 percent more marine resources including in the diet. So I don't know if I have convinced you, <laughs> but that's the next speaker. <laughs> So my PhD was a little bit different because I looked at 19th century Britain, um, specifically England, and mine's actually looking at socioeconomic status differences between food intake. So uh, I don't know how to talk about my whole PhD today, so I'm focusing on one specific part of it, which was the analysis of around 2,000 individuals um, for their metabolic pathologies. And these sites, they're from seven sites, uh, four are from London, one's from Birmingham, one's from Newcastle, and one's from South Shields. Uh, all of the results I'm going to present today are for children, because that's what I'm focusing on at the moment with this presentation, uh, and also supporting historical evidence. But I also did in my PhD the analysis of convict heights from working class population from National Archives, because height is um, an indicator of kind of childhood growth, which is related to nutrition and environment. And I also looked at the analysis of modern nutrient intake uh, for socioeconomic status, because essentially my PhD is looking at how diet has changed over time, and what we can learn from the past which, that we can implement today in modern public health policies. So if anyone's interested in that, do kind of give me a shout or something. Um, so first of all, the results of my logistic regression analysis. So I looked at four different types of pathology, rickets, which is vitamin D deficiency, scurvy, which is vitamin C deficiency, and cripple orbitalia and mammal hyperplasia, which are both conditions found in the bones, and they basically indicate some kind of metabolic stress during childhood. So it can be, it can be nutrient, it can also be environmental, but um, I included those anyway. <laughs> so what we find uh, in these results, first of all, is that for scurvy, for cripple orbitalia, and for mammal hyperplasia, there was no statistically significant difference between high and low income or status children and their risk of having these pathologies. However, for rickets, which is vitamin D, we find that there is a statistically significant difference, and actually it was high-status children who were more at risk of having rickets in the 19th century. So it seems to suggest from these results on face value that there was a higher level of equality between nutrient intake in the past for 19th century children. But for vitamin D deficiency, uh, it seems that high-status individuals were more um, likely to have this disease. And this obviously raises the question of why does this appear to be so equal apart from vitamin D? So this is where I turned to the uh, historical evidence for this. So I used a lot of different textbooks. Most of these are kind of childcare textbooks which were available for the upper classes presumably because they could afford them, they could read them and also afford to implement the suggestions. So from the historical sources that I found, it seemed to suggest that there was quite a lot of um, equality between the types of infant feeding, at least until this, around two years of age, which is when these conditions would have developed, at least for rickets and for scurvy and um, cripple battalion. So first of all, I looked into wealthy families. How do they feed their children? And there's actually a surprising lack of evidence for this um, that I've begun to find, not much published on it. So I went back to the Times newspaper and had a look through. And um, he, here's some articles from around the early 1800s which showed uh, wet nurses advertising their services in the Times. So they'd, they'd have their babies, um, they'd get to a certain age, and then they'd want to wean them. But they'd be like, well, I can make some money, so I'll advertise myself. So we've got three here. Um, they always suggest that they're married, so obviously that's quite a respectable way to be. You don't want to have had a child and not have a, a husband. Um, they always say that they've got kind of healthy children most of the time, apart from this poor lady whose child died. They often didn't write that because it kind of suggested that maybe they weren't very good at being white nurse. Um, but they'd, they'd say they were healthy, they'd say that they were um, had good character and um, basically advertised their services. And upper class people would see these adverts and presumably hire. So what were they looking for exactly? Well. I know that the upper classes didn't breastfeed that often. First of all, because of childcare texts 
which suggests that they didn't. So this one's from 1801, and he says that the peasant whom necessity compels to follow nature is in this respect happier than his lord. So essentially this person's suggesting that poor people did rescue their children, and this way they were actually healthier in some terms than upper classes who refused to do it. Another one here says that it's the most proper food for a child, but some mothers are disposed to suckle their own children. And the third one, which is a particularly good one, from 1828, says, in the higher station of life in Britain, ladies have deemed the office of nursing derogatory, as in their opinion, it assumes the appearance of poor orders of persons. So what this is suggesting is not only that women from wealthier families were refusing to breastfeed for various reasons, but also that women from poorer families would breastfeed. And it makes a lot of sense, because obviously if you're from a poorer family, you can't afford to um, buy the services of a wet nurse. <coughs> now in terms of how to hire wet nurses, there was quite a lot of um, advice out there for women. So there's this one from uh, 1889 and one from 1839. And what I find really interesting about these is uh, one of these texts is actually called Four Mothers. So these were actually um, meant to be read by women themselves. They weren't necessarily medical textbooks, they were aimed at families. And they uh, suggest that you should always get your medical doctor to give kind of a service check over of the woman you're hiring. Um, so the medical doctors would come in, they'd look at their general health, they'd look at the health of her milk, they'd also look at the health of her children if there are any left surviving. But interestingly, and in quite a lot of detail, <laughs> they go into um, how the breast should look, its size, the large quantity of fat, but also how it feels to the touch. And it says this twice in these two different texts here, it should be firm to the touch. So it suggests that medical doctors were actually not only looking at women's breasts, but they were feeling them and kind of doing a proper examination, which during the 19th century, um, where we kind of feel like they were quite modest and quite kind of reserved, it's a little bit interesting to see how they were doing it then to how we feel about it today. <laughs> so we kind of see that in the past, it seemed to be more equality because children were receiving breast milk at least, and if they weren't, they were receiving pap, which tended to be either water or animal milk mixed with a bit of bread. So it was quite equal until the weaning time, which was around six to 12 months of age from most of the sources. Um, but at weaning, we also see again, there's quite a high level of equality between uh, high and low incomes. So the wealthy were recommended again from childcare tests to feed them milk, puddings, broths, and little meat. Uh, beef tea is mentioned quite often. Um, and basically animal nourishment and kind of very soft things, soft puddings like suet pudding and things like this. For working class children, it's slightly more difficult to uh, kind of ascertain what it was that they were eating exactly, because we don't have those kinds of very specific textbooks. But what we do have is um, workhouse dietaries which contains diets for children. And we see children alone are the ones eating the suet pudding. We also see, obviously, they're eating gruel. And you could think, well, this could just be something that was just in the workhouse. But we also have things from the Foundling Hospital, which was specifically for children. And uh, they would be eating uh, rice pudding, suet pudding, cooked, a little bit of cooked beef, and beef to be boiled into soup. So again, quite similar types of food between the high and low classes. So we see in terms of diet, it seems to be quite similar between high and low incomes, but not so much for rickets. And rickets is a disease, uh, obviously vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D is formed in the skin after uh, synthesis from sunlight. So you actually need to be in the sun to create enough vitamin D, which is why there's currently an issue with it in this country. Um, and there are a couple of reasons. So the first is it could be due to swaddling. Did the upper classes swaddle their children more and did that cause it? But it seems to have been discounted by a couple of studies which have looked at modern swaddling practices and um, prevalence of rickets. And they say that's not really a thing. And um, also, we know that we don't know whether it would have been more likely to swaddle a child as a wealthy family as compared to low income families. Pollution is another possibility, but these children would have been living in this, not necessarily the same neighbourhoods, but under the same sky. So if we were to see anything, it would be equality between rickets. And also, wealthy people were living kind of on the suburbs a lot of the time, more in more rural areas. So we would, ne we would expect, if it was pollution, to see low-income children having more rickets. So really, the only op option I could think of was time spent outdoors. And if you think about the number of children people had and how small their houses were during the 19th century for the working classes, it makes sense to send your children to play outside. 
And this is actually a photo from the mid-19th century in Newcastle, which is where one of my samples is from, which shows children with their faces uncovered, their little ankles and the arms uncovered. And really, your arms in the sun is often all you need for a certain amount of time to get enough vitamin D. On the other hand, for, for the upper classes, they would have had larger houses. They would also have had um, areas which were specifically designated for children to stay in. And if you think of it from kind of a parental perspective, would you want your child to play in 19th century London? Like, I probably wouldn't send them out there. So I think it was very much, although the behaviour was very different uh, in the 19th century between socioeconomic status, I think diet was actually surprisingly similar, at least until around two years of age. So, to conclude our introductory uh, PowerPoint, we've just uh, talked a little bit about the benefits of the network. So, as we mentioned, we're from three different universities, Leeds, Sheffield and York, um, and we're funded by the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities, who are great funders, and they really provide a lot of support and um, a lot of kind of options and opportunities to do things like this, and also to get some career advancement advice. Um, yeah, so the network really, our network provided a lot of <coughs> opportunities to um, talk about our experiences and uh, although we came from the same backgrounds, our PhDs really took a different, very different um, directions. We also got to have really good insight into how each other managed our time and our research, um, which has been really interesting, I'm sure they would agree. <laughs> and also regular contact with each other, which I think we've already mentioned. So thank you for everyone listening. Here's the uh, link to our blog again, and if Jennifer would like to come up. <laughs>